in introduction um, um, and praise for my work. Uh, I'm not sure if I, I hope it uh, lives up to that. Um, I, I follow in the footsteps of some great scholars uh, who have addressed audiences here before. Um, and uh, that makes me a little nervous, uh, I must say. I also apologize um, <clears throat> for my voice. I've uh, picked up some sort of bug in Calcutta. Uh, normally I sound a little bit like Sean Connery, but uh, today <laughs> I'm going to be uh, a little bit croaky. Um, also, I'd like to thank very much um, Professor Mian, the Vice-Chancellor, for giving me the opportunity to come here and, and address you all. Um, I'm thrilled at the turnout. I'm thrilled that um, quite a number of old friends of mine from Hyderabad are here today, um, people who helped me with the research for my book, The Last Nizam. Is that all right? Is that, yep. Um, and uh, it's also an honour to be here at uh, Malana Azad University uh, to see such a fine institution. I understand this was only established in 1998, named after, of course, one of the great heroes of India's independence movement, a man who believed in that India should remain united, and I think that was a very noble aim. And also thrilled to hear that uh, after many years, a Deccan Studies Centre has been set up here. Um, when I was researching uh, the last Nizam book, uh, I felt strongly that there was that there was just so many extraordinary that, that, that the history of this dynasty um, the Asaf Jahis was so extraordinary and to my mind at least in in the English sources that I, uh, I had accessed um, there had been really uh, you know, a, a paucity of scholarship I'm not of course um, forgetting for a moment the extraordinary work of uh, Vasan Bawa who's here in the audience and I'm not sure if any other, I'm sure some of you here have also worked on, um, you know, the history of Hyderabad and the Nizams. I exclude you from that, um, that, that statement, but it's, it's, I think it's terrific that uh, a Deccan Studies Centre specifically focusing on, the, on what was, after all, India's greatest princely state has been set up, and I look forward to seeing uh, more scholarship um, coming from here. Um, the, the topic I've been given, uh, weaving together history and biography of the Nizams, is uh, an impossibly broad topic to uh, uh, cover in, in a short lecture like this. Indeed, it's the sort of thing that one could write books on. Um, as I perhaps uh, mentioned at the outset, I'm not a historian, I'm a journalist by training. And, uh, um, but I spent a long, very long time in India and uh, felt and, and came across some remarkable stories and, and felt that when I left India, uh, I always owed a debt to this country because it has given me so much, a debt to give something back to it um, in the form of, uh, of a book, which is what motivated me to write The Last Nizam. Now, um, people have also asked me whether the you know, both the Last Nizam and the Mysterious Mr. Jacob book, whether they're, uh, whether this is pure biography or whether it's history, whether it's a blend of the two. Maybe we can have a bit of a discussion about that later. But um, <clears throat> I see myself primarily as a biographer. Um, and most of the books that I read tend to be either biographies or histories. Um, a great deal depends, of course, on how they're written, but I find both genres equally enjoyable. When it comes to putting pen to paper, however, I prefer concentrating on the lives of individuals. For me, biographies add a special dimension to the study of history. As the American historian Arthur Schlesinger pointed out, political leaders, whether they be presidents or prime ministers, are not supermen but human beings, worrying about decisions, attending to wives and children, juggling balls in the air, and putting on their pants one leg at a time. I guess I'm, for one, am always searching for the next eccentric figure living an extraordinary life in an exotic setting to write about. But writing about such a figure without describing the historical milieu in which they lived would be a futile exercise. We would only get half the story. 
For me, the great satisfaction in writing biographies is not only do I get to pluck an obscure or misunderstood figure from the past, and I'm particularly referring to um, Alexander Jacob, the, the uh, subject of my second book, and bringing them to life, I get to read against the historical tide that they were swimming with or struggling against. Biographies, of course, don't have to be about great heroic figures such as Mahatma Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, Barack Obama, or indeed um, the Nizams. They can be about people from all walks of life and social classes. Indeed, the lives of, of less exalted, ordinary people can give us an extraordinary insight into the ways in which particular institutions and events as well as large-scale social, economic and political developments were felt, experienced and understood by those who lived through them. A biographical approach in history therefore offers an important addition to the understanding of societies and historical eras. So far I've written two biographies about two very different individuals. Alexander Jacob and Mukram Jah never met. Jacob died in obscurity in 1921. Mukram Jah was not born until 1933. But their lives somehow intersected right here in Hyderabad. It was Mukram Jah's great-great-grandfather, Mir Mahbub Ali Khan, who tried to purchase what was then known as the Imperial Diamond from Alexander Jacob in 1891. While I'll be concentrating on the legacy of the Nizams in this talk, I do want to briefly compare and contrast these two fascinating individuals. What struck me most when researching the pasts of Alexander Jacob and Mukram Jah was their relationship to the events around them. Jacob took advantage of the social and historical milieu, the West's fascination with the occult and Eastern mysticism, the weakness of Indian rulers for what the British dismissed as sparkling pieces of vanity. These are the diamonds that he, was, that he would deal with, he dealt with in his arm. And the geopolitical tension stirred up by the great game. Mukram Jah was very much a slave to his dynasty's past and the tumultuous changes that took place during his lifetime. Jacob exploited every opening he could find, whereas Mukram Jah was unfortunately, towards the end of his life, exploited by those around him. Jacob turned his skills at performing sleights of hand into a reputation for being the greatest wonder worker of his time, a man credited with making grapes grow out of walking sticks and, and projecting past lives onto the, room, onto the walls of his dining room. He turned a rudimentary knowledge of stone, precious stones acquired as an apprentice in a British firm in Calcutta into the most famous jewellery and antique business on the subcontinent. And he took full advantage of the Raj's lacklustre intelligence gathering network to position himself as a spy master of sorts for the British. Mukram Jah was the opposite, turning down many of the openings that came his way. He refused to capitalise on his religious status. Many still revere him as the Caliph of Islam. His political pulling power or the opportunity to opportunity to invest his wealth productively. Quite a few Indian princes turned their palaces into hotels, ran for politics, or became entrepreneurs. Mukram Jha, as we know, bought a half million acre sheep station in one of the most remote parts of Australia and decided to live like a hermit. So how did it come to pass that Mukram Jha would swap the greatness of Hyderabad for a kingdom of kangaroos and acacias? The answer lies not only in Mukram Jha's unique personality, but I believe in Hyderabad's history. <clears throat> As we all know, the Asaf Jahis were one of the greatest ruling dynasties in India. Hyderabad was the largest, richest and most powerful uh, state and the most important centre of Islamic learning east of Mecca. The groundwork for this extraordinary dynasty was some laid by someone I regard as one of the most interesting figures of 18th century India, Nizam or Mulk. First known as Kamruddin, 
Nizam Umuk was just six years old when he was brought to the emperor's court in Agra by his father in 1677. According to the imperial records, Aurangzeb told his father, the star of destiny shines on the forehead of your son. That destiny was to see Kamruddin carve, out a, a new, carve a new state out of the chaos that accompanied the disintegration of the Mughal Empire for, following the death of Aurangzeb in 1707. After a decisive battle in 1724 in which he defeated his main rival, Mubrais Khan, the Emperor Muhammad Shah bestowed on Kamruddin the highest title that can be awarded to the subject of the Mughal Empire, that of Asaf Jah, or equal to Asaf, the Grand Wazir in the court of the biblical ruler, King Solomon. What, what I find fascinating about Nizam or Mulk is that he never formally declared his independence and insisted that his rule was entirely based on the trust uh, reposed in him by the Mughal emperor, to whom he swore eternal loyalty. The Nizam's dominions yielded an income that was almost equal to the rest of the Mughal, Mughal em empire, yet there was no throne, no crown, and no symbol of sovereignty. Coins were minted in the emperor's name until 1858, and it was in the name of the Mughal ruler and not the Nizam, that prayers were read out in the Kutbah, or Friday Sermon. As the Viceroy of the Deccan, the Nizam was, the head of, was head of the executive and judicial departments and the source of all civil and military authority. Assisted by a Dewan, the Nizams drafted their own laws, raised their own armies, flew their own flags and formed their own governments, but they refused to adopt the title of king. It was not until India was granted independence in 1947 that the seventh Nizam, Osman Ali Khan, formally claimed to be a ruler in his own right. But by then it was too late for a sovereign Hyderabad to coexist in a free India. Its independence lasted less than 400 days. Nizam al-Mulk's first priority was to consolidate his empire and establish security, which was constantly under threat. In 1739, he answered a desperate plea from Muhammad Shah to help prevent the invasion of Delhi by the Persian conqueror Nadir, Nadir Shah. Nizam al Mulk was unable to prevent the march on Delhi, but he was able to stop what would have been a complete annihilation of the city by Nadir Shah's troops, usually using a Persian couplet to appeal to the ruler's sense of justice. If only we could do that today, use couplets to stop wars and massacres. Um, <clears throat> ironically, Nizam al Mulk would become a beneficiary of Delhi's downfall as a steady stream of exiles from the Mughal capital to the Deccan became a flood. Administrators, artisans, musicians, poets and religious leaders were welcomed to the Nizam's court. Despite the unrest that spread through his dominions in the final years of his rule, Nizam al Mulk is remembered as laying the foundation for what would become the most important Muslim state outside the Middle East in the, fir by the, in the first half of the 20th century. Just days before he died, Asaf Jah dictated his last will and testament. The document was a blueprint for governance and personal con conduct that ranged from advice on how to keep troops happy and well-fed to an apology for neglecting his wife. He reminded his successors to remain subservient to the Mughal emperor who had granted them their office and rank. He warned against declaring war unnecessarily and he urged fiscal restraint. There is enough money in the treasury to last seven generations if properly spent, he said. Finally, he insisted, you must not lend your ears to the tittle-tattle of backbiters and slanderers, nor suffer the riffraff to approach your presence. Had the wishes of the first Nizam been followed, not only until the reign of the seventh Nizam, but until today, it would have moulded a very different dynasty from the one that would totter between plenty and penury and be constantly prey to slander and court intrigues. Rather than building on the foundations that Nizam al Mulk had laid for statehood, his successors began tearing it down. Power-hungry rulers obsessed with their own comfort, security and wealth conveniently forgot the more salient points of Nizam al-Mulk's testament. 
His warnings about the folly of wars fought for the sake of conquest were ignored. His belief that the income of the state would last for seven generations did not anticipate the fire sale of territories and their revenues that his heirs were forced to undertake for the dynasty to survive. The British and the French were well placed to take advantage of the chaos that followed Nizam al-Mulk's death. The crumbling might of the Mughal Empire had stirred their empire-building ambitions. The first Nizam had maintained strict neutrality um, between the, in his dealings with the European powers, perceiving correctly the danger of becoming a pawn in hostilities that were being played out half a world away. But that advice too was forgotten as his sons fought over the spoil of empires, losing much of their territory in the process. It was into this unfolding scenario that Richard Wesley stepped, an uncompromising empire builder who between 1798 and 1804 expanded the East India Company's holdings from a few small pockets of territory to most of southern India, the entire eastern coastal strip, all of Bengal and parts of northern India. By the end of his reign as Governor General, British troops would be in occupation in Hyderabad and Pune and residents stationed at every native court. The crowning point of Wesley's career was the Treaty of Perpetual and, De and General Defensive Alliance signed in 1800 with the second Nizam, Nizam Ali Khan. The treaty was a master stroke of British diplomacy, giving the British complete control over the Nizam's external affairs without imposing on them any stringent or matching obligation. By signing the treaty, the Nizam signed away his status as an independent ruler for the next 150 years. The treaty guaranteed the integrity of the Nizam's dominions against all threats, but the Nizam was forbidden to enter into any negotiations with an external power without reference to the company's government. By 1803, when Nizam Ali Khan was succeeded by Sikandar Jah, the real power in the state lay in the hands of the British resident. The resident was in many ways a power in his own right, maintaining Britain's supremacy, approving executive appointments and ensuring with varying degrees of success that the local administration was efficient and free of corruption. Of Britain's residents, a number like James Kirkpatrick whose liaison with Khair Unissa was so wonderfully described by William Dalrymple in The White Moguls, were enlightened men who spoke fluent Hindustani and Persian, wore Mughal-style dresses at home, smoked hookers, chewed betel nut, and became enamoured of Hyderabad's rulers. Others, like Henry Russell, were fierce critics of all the Nizam stood for. I'll just spend a little time on the period when Russell was resident in the 1810s, as for me it represented one of the lower points in Hyderabad's history, and in many ways was a dress rehearsal for what happened a century and a half later when Mukram Jah took on the mantle of being the eighth Nizam. Vain, ambitious and corruptible, Russell had arrived in Hyderabad in 1801 as an assistant to Kirkpatrick. He had little time for the Nizam, who he believed presided over a system that was rotten to the core. He was also a strong supporter of Chandu Lal, a Hindu moneylender who became the de facto Duan in 1809. From then until his resignation in 1843, Chandu Lal exerted more influence over Hyderabad than any other individual, obliging both the British and the Nizam through the reckless expenditure of Hyderabad's revenues that in the process nearly sent the state broke. When the third Nizam, Sikandar Jah, demanded that Russell sack Chandulal, he was so stung by his rebuke that he withdrew to the Chamahala Palace and took no further role in the administration of the state. The seclusion was so complete that four years elapsed before he ventured outside the palace on the pretext of going on a hunting expedition with his harem and 4,000 foot soldiers. The Nizam's seclusion only served to strengthen Chandu Lal's position in the court. The de facto Diwan became the sole authority for the conduct of business. He also became the linchpin in Russell's ingenious plan to strengthen the company's stranglehold over Hyderabad while enriching himself in the process. 
In 1812, two battalions of the Nizam's army mutinied and threatened to blow their British commander out of the mouth of a cannon until they were, unless they were paid on time and their offences pardoned. To Russell, this episode underlined the need to professionalise the Nizam's forces. With the help of Chandulal, he established the Russell Brigade. Chandulal <clears throat> made sure that payment for the brigade came from the state treasury. As the brigade grew, so did its cost. The commander was paid £5,000 a month and, like many other officers, received a house and servants. Keeping a cut for himself, Russell kept on creating fresh posts for new applicants until the proverbial expression in Hyderabad became, poor Nizi pays for all. <coughs> However, poor Nizi could not pay for all without borrowing money. And here again, Russell and Chandulal came up with the perfect solution. Namely, to allow the establishment of a banking firm known as William Palmer & Company. Under the arrangement, the Nizam's treasury borrowed money from Palmer & Company to pay for the troops of the Russell Brigade to the tune of 4 million rupees a year, or roughly half the entire revenue of the state. Palmer & Company then paid the troops and recovered what they had spent plus interest, which was charged at 24% from the villages mortgaged by the Nizam. Forced into paying for troops he had no control over and little, if any, use for, Hyderabad was pretty much at peace at this time, the Nizam was soon caught in a dangerous debt trap. By the end of the 1810s, the Nizam owed Palmer and company a staggering six million rupees. Charles Metcalfe, who became resident in 1820, was so shocked by what he saw that he wrote, I can hardly imagine a situation today more entitled to pity or more calculated to disarm criticism than that of a prince so held in subjection by his servant under the support of an irrepressible foreign power. I'm not saying that all of Hyderabad's rulers responded to the unequal power structures that the British imposed of them, on them in the same way as Sikandar Jar. Hyderabad, as we all know, benefited, benefited from the foresight and experience of Salah Jung, who steadied the state's revenues and introduced important administrative and fiscal reforms. Mahbub Ali Khan was so revered by the population, he was nicknamed the Beloved and Osman Ali Khan was credited with transforming Hyderabad into a semi-modern state through his fast, vast public works and reforms. But there was a certain pattern that marked the workings of the royal court for much of its history. Hyderabad's rulers did everything possible to keep the government of the day off their back while leaving the administration of the state to their own hand-picked lieutenants. This hands-off approach encouraged corruption and a general unwillingness to rein in extravagant expenditure and address basic cash flow prov prov problems. <clears throat> These psychophants kept their rulers in the dark, knowing their interests were best served by pretending everything was in order. When Mukram Jah was crowned the Eighth Nizam in 1967, very little of this medieval character had changed. Despite two decades of being groomed in the finest public schools, universities and military academies, and at one point being placed under the guidance of India's foremost statesman, Jawahar Nehru, Mukram Jah was totally unprepared for the responsibilities expected of him. He had few friends in Hyderabad and was more at home listening to jazz in London nightclubs than to ghazals in the great hall of the Chalmahala Palace. <coughs> The burden of history weighed heavily on him right from the beginning. In 18, sorry, 1948, when he was just 15 years old, Hyderabad lost its independence in the police action. In 1971, Indira Gandhi would abolish the privy purses. India's tax officials were determined to get a slice of whatever revenue they could raise from his vast estate. <coughs> Jah had also the misfortune from coming from a rather dysfunctional family. In an arranged marriage meant to cement ties between the Muslim world's two most important families, Mukram Jah's father and uncle were matched with the daughter and niece of the last caliph, Abdul Majid. For Osman Ali Khan, 
This arrangement was more than just an alliance of convenience. The offspring of such a union would be the next caliph. Mukram Jah's father, however, proved to be a poor role model, spending much of his time accumulating vast gambling debts and neglecting his wife, the beautiful Durasheva. The situation became so intolerable that, Mukram, that Osman Ali Khan disinherited Azam and decided that the princely crown be passed on to Mukram Jah instead. Unfortunately, Jah was destined to repeat the mistakes, many of the mistakes of his forefathers. Instead of retreating into his palace for four years without emerging like Sikandar Jah, he escaped to the Australian bush. He left the administration of his vast inheritance to a succession of Chandu Laos, incompetent officials who over the years would do their best to hide the real financial position of his estate from him. Substitute the bank Indo-Suez in Geneva for Palmer and Company, and I think you begin to see a pattern. Of course, not all those who advised Mukram Jah in, the, in these early days can be categorised in this way. Indeed, I met many of his friends who warned him about what was happening, but unfortunately, to no avail. As we all know, by the early 1980s, Mukram Jah was in serious financial trouble, and his first impulse was to auction off part of the crown jewels, which included what is what was now known as the Jacob Diamond. Unfortunately, his father, grandfather had put the crown jewels into various trusts precisely to guard against this sort of eventuality. The trustees decided to give the Indian government first option at buying the jewels. Not surprisingly, New Delhi was only offering a fraction of the 6 to 7 billion rupees that the 173 pieces would fetch on the open market. And it was not until 2002 that Mukram Jah would pocket his share of the proceeds for, of the sale. But by then it was too late. In 1996, after being forced to sell his sheep farm to cover his debts, he left Australia and went to Turkey. So was Mukram Jah just a slave to history or did his personality have something to do with it? I do believe that he, his upbringing played a role. His mother, Durasheva, wanted to give him the best education and training, but she also estranged him from his Indian roots. His grandfather, Osman Ali Khan, also played a role. Time and time again, when Durasheva insisted that her son be given a normal education among his peers at, say, the Dune School, Osman Ali Khan found some pretext to send him back to Hyderabad, where he would attend one of the small palace schools. As Philip Mason, who briefly tutored the young Mukram and his brother Mufakam, wrote in his memoir, A Shaft of, Sun, a Shaft of Sunlight, Durasheva wanted them preserved from the corruption that grew from continual flattery and from wealth without responsibility. There was no one in the whole state who would say no to them except their mother, who was not always around, and their grandfather, who they rarely saw. And you have to add to that a certain eccentricity, which I must say for meeting Mukaram Jai, he wore like a badge on his sleeve. Bilkis Aladin, uh, who lived behind Mukram Jah's Banjara Hills house, told me how she had once seen him spending all day and night at a garage under one of his cars. He never made out he was royalty. It was frustration, prob prob probably. The setup here was very medieval, she said to me. I couldn't end this talk without mentioning something of Mukram Jah's legacy. It is unfortunate that. Hyderabad's architectural and cultural heritage is poorer for the fact that he didn't remain here to prevent palaces being encroached on or pulled down and tons of priceless antiques ending up in the, in the catalogues of Sotheby's and Christie's when they should have stayed in India. Fortunately, that neglect is being rectified. I have yet to see the Chalmahalla Palace since the completion of its renovation. But from what I have read, Princess Ezra and her team of restorers deserve the highest praise for making it in one of the finest museums in India. The Falak Numa, of course, is now one of the world's most luxurious hotels, and I understand that steps are being taken to undertake the King Koti Palace. 
Hyderabad's potential as an IT hub and industrial powerhouse has clearly been realised. Now its cultural heritage needs to be brought to the fore. If my book has helped even in a tiny way by raising awareness of this city's enormous potential in that regard, then I am honoured. Thank you.